Now, when we come, when it comes to illusion, when it comes to objects, I like you said objects and suffering. Mm -hmm. You said illusion as the objects. I think that's what you said, isn't it? Yes. Objects and suffering. Now, is suffering a type of object? Yes. It is. Correct. Do you think it is? I think so. Why but I'm think? not sure. My question was actually today was around emotions, like uh, like thoughts. Mm. I had in my mind figured that those are illusion, but the mm. emotion part is where I was confused. Mm. Okay. So we that have was a do... question today. Yes. Great. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Um, so we have to define what an object is. So we know when we say an object, objects and suffering are illusion. You said object. So what is an object? Can anyone tell me or Karen what an object is? Anyone else? Not Karen or me. Can anyone else? And not Jimmy. <laughs> Demetrius, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, Demetrius. I guess you could say something that you can perceive. Yeah, that's right. And that's how I define it as well, Karen. Anything you can perceive. So anything you can perceive is an object. Okay. Mm -hmm. With any of the senses. With any of the senses, correct. Is that okay? Yes. Or with um, the, you've got your five senses, or with the sixth sense, which is the mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all we can say, um, another definition, does anyone know another definition? So Gordon said anything you perceive as an object. And perception does imply sense organs. It does imply, you know, you're hearing something, you're smelling something, you're tasting something, you're seeing something. Demetrius again. Uh, something which comes and goes. Something which comes and goes. Yes, that's another great definition of an object. Um, that is true. The problem with that definition can be that when we abide as the self, the experience, there's an experience of the practice that can seem to come and go. The experience of binding itself can seem to come and go. It doesn't really, but it can seem to. And that's a very good definition. Of an Anything that comes and goes is an object. Okay. Um, there's another, and I'll, I'll just say it because um, it's what I'm looking for. Another definition of an object is anything that arises in your consciousness. Anything that arises in your consciousness. Yeah. So this means um, the body, the mind, the world. Mm. Okay. But we can add two more categories to those three. Knowledge and experience. Any experience you have is an object. Any knowledge in the mind is an object. Okay. Anything that are, so let's come, let's make it simple again. An object is anything that you can perceive. So can you, when you have a thought, you perceive a thought, you see it. Now you don't see it with the sense organ of the eye, but you see it with the mind's eye the sixth sense, I'm calling it, the mind. That mind perceives the thoughts. Um, anything you perceive, anything that arises in your consciousness, arises, speaks to Demetrius' second definition of object. He said anything that comes and goes. So the coming is the arising, and the going is the disappearing. So anything that arises in your consciousness, that means it wasn't there before, and now it's risen up, it's appearing. Anything that appears in your consciousness is an object. Maybe that's a better phrase. Anything that appears in your consciousness is an object. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
So our feelings, our emotions, are they objects, Karen? I'm asking you. What do you think? And please don't worry. Look, please don't. I know I'm putting you on the spot here. Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind. Good. Please don't mind yeah. at all. It doesn't matter. I don't, this, no, this, I don't. I, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> good. Good. Um, so I think that the. They think the feelings or emotions are separate, but turn into a thought. They're closely linked. So they sometimes are. it's time to distinguish. Yes. They are different. Emotions and thoughts are not the same. Right, right. But emotions require some kind of thought, some kind of... It, even if it's some very rudimentary type of thought, it requires some kind of thought, some kind of cognition. That proceeds, or I always wonder, is it something physiological that occurs first? It, it depends, um, but there has to be some kind of thought first. So I guess I've just answered it. Okay, okay. There has to be some kind of thought first, otherwise you cannot have... An emotion but if you're talking about a very young child like a newborn baby that thought process is not going to be right. what we commonly think of right. as thinking right. it's not going to be complex ordered linguistic thinking thinking in language it's going to be pre-verbal thought you know hmm. like if a baby is um hungry there's somehow in quotes a thought or a registering that i'm hungry and therefore, I'm going to start to cry because that's that's one of the way, ways babies will signal they're hungry. But there's some kind of registering in somehow in the brain that I'm hungry, and you can call that very rudimentary thought. The baby's not going to be conscious of; they're not going to call it hunger because they're not aware of that word when they're a newborn. You know, so it's on that kind of level. There has to be some kind of rudimentary cognition, cognitive process happening. A lot of it's reflexes when you're very, very young. But for adults, we can we can say for, we can say as a general as a general rule that thoughts precede emotions as a general rule. We may feel that emotions precede thoughts, but that's often because we don't have insight into why we're feeling the way we are. And those thought processes that actually precede the emotions have become subconscious. Okay. Yeah. And so they've become like a reflex. So, yeah, you can start, you can feel an emotion very quickly, like an avalanche of emotion, and not really be aware of the thought process that underlies that. And the less psychological work you've done, the less psychologically you are aware of yourself, the more it will feel like emotions sometimes precede thoughts. The more you analyze and look into your thoughts and emotions, the more you'll generally come to see that there's always a thought process that underlies an emotion, almost always. From a practical point of view, we can say the thoughts come before the emotions. Yeah. So. Um, if you're scared of something, you can't be scared of something unless you have some understanding or thought about what it is you're scared of. Do you see? Mm -hmm. no. if, if, and I sometimes give the example, if you're, if you're standing on some railway tracks, some train tracks, and a train's hurtling towards you at high speed. Now, it's natural, in that, and, natural and, intelligent, and intelligent in that context to be afraid because a train's hurtling towards you at high speed and you're, you're standing in the middle of some train tracks. So it's, it's an intelligent response to be afraid. If your brain wasn't functioning properly, say you weren't able to think, you know, say you had a very severe form of dementia or somebody had injected you with a drug, which meant that your brain is not working. You could still see and speak, but you just couldn't think. You might not even recognize what a train, if you had severe dementia, you might not recognize what a train is. You might not recognize that you're standing on the train tracks. You might not recognize that if this train hits you, it can be very damaging for the body. 
so you don't feel fear you just stand there with a, maybe with a smile on your face as this train hurtles ever closer towards you yeah but if your brain is functioning immediately your brain will recognize the threats and that's thinking that's a thought process as i've demonstrated by giving you the case of someone with severe dementia in which that thought process isn't there the fear response may not be there the emotional response but when, 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 if you just put yourself in this imaginary situation again, when you're standing on the train tracks and you see the train, the first thing you would probably experience is fear. You just get a jolt of fear through your body. You wouldn't be aware of the thought process. Right. It would just be so quick. There's a train. I'm on the train tracks. I'm in danger. Vroom, fear, panic, anxiety, stress. So the, what you feel first is the most people, especially strong emotions, they'll feel the emotion first. But there is a thought process that underlies it. You can see in that example. Yes. Yes. And all other emotions really follow that kind of pattern pretty much. And the ones we care about, certainly. So back to my question for you, Karen. Yeah. Are emotions objects? I don't know. Okay. Good. Great. That's great. What is often if I something ask you, you perceive, right? Something object. you perceive, yeah. Yes. That's the first definition. Yeah. If I'm asking you guys questions, any of you here, and you get the question wrong, that can be very beneficial for you, by the way, because it means the teaching can stick more firmly in your mind. Hopefully, if I'm teaching well to you. So. Give me the two definitions of an object again, Karen, if you can. It's something oh. that you can perceive. Yes, that's definition yes. one. Yeah. Can you remember yes. the second definition? Um, something that um, can't come and go. No. An object. It can come. That and can go. come and go. Excuse me. Can come yeah. and go. Yes. But the second, yeah. the two definitions I'd like to stick to is the first one, as you said, it's anything you can perceive as an object. Mm -hmm. And the second definition is anything that arises in consciousness. Okay. Remember? Anything that appears in your mm -hmm. consciousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that second definition is something that comes and goes, essentially. It's the same, it's a different formulation of that same definition. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Anything you don't understand about that? No, I get that. So an emotion. Is an emotion an object? Yes. Are you sure? It rises in consciousness and it's perceived. Is it? So it, feel, it feels to me like it would be an object. That's correct. Yes. Emotions are objects. They rise in consciousness don't they and you're aware of them right you're aware of it um it, it some it's something that comes and goes the emotion isn't always the same is it no here's another definition anything that changes anything that changes is an object It's the same thing as Dimitri said, anything that comes and goes, mm -hmm. that means it changes. Right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another aspect of change. Yeah. These are objects. Now, where, where you're getting confused is the difference between what Jimmy called gross and subtle objects. Okay. Did you hear that bit where he said gross and subtle objects? Yes. Yes. So I often define what a gross object is and what a subtle object is. Would you like me to do that for you? Yes, please. So a gross object, gross means, in this context, it means coarse, yeah? As opposed to subtle, which means fine. So coarse and fine. It doesn't mean gross as in disgusting. It means gross as in coarse or larger, yeah? So gross objects are anything that's perceived by the sense organs. Yeah, these are your everyday objects that we would consider to be external to the body-mind. Okay. 
or even you could say like if i could see my hat so tables chairs cars buildings the clouds in the sky the stars the sun yeah, these are all gross objects yeah and if i can see my hand here this would be a gross object my hand's a gross object as well i can see it with my eyes yeah now a subtle object well i should say gross objects again if we take the common place view of reality and gross objects are in the public sphere or at least they potentially are so if you can see a bus someone else can see the same bus and you can talk about it and you can compare notes you can say what color is that bus and your friend says oh it's a red bus and you can say yes i agree that is a red bus you see how many windows does it have oh it has this many windows yes i agree it has this many windows yeah and you can both see the bus whatever gross object you're talking about how many fingers am i holding up you're holding up two fingers tom yes that's correct i'm holding up two fingers this kind of thing it's in a it's, these gross objects are in the public domain potentially the reason i say potentially is that you know you might be in a sitting in a room in your house where no one can get into the house apart from you <laughs> you know <laughs> and you're looking at a chair that chair would be a gross object now, no one else can see it. It's not in the public domain, meaning that no one else can see that chair because no one else is in your house or in your room. Mm. But it's potentially in the public domain. Potentially, someone else could see the chair, right? Mm. Subtle objects are the, those things that are perceived with this sixth sense, the mind. Okay? They are your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your imaginings your imagination, your ideas, your knowledge, your dreams, spiritual experiences, your so-called inner world. Yeah. I These get are... that. Sorry? Now I get that finally. Got it. Yeah. They, <laughs> they're, they're subtle objects. Mm -hmm. Now, if gross objects are, are public, these are private. Meaning... If you're thinking a thought, ordinarily, no one else will know what you're thinking unless you tell them. You know, if you have an emotion, nobody can el nobody else knows for sure what you're feeling. I mean, it might be very obvious that you look happy or you look sad, mm -hmm. but the actual emotion itself, so you can give clues, you can give outward clues on what you're feeling, but no one else can actually perceive directly the emotion that you're perceiving. So it's private in that sense. And is that the run by the ego mind in essence? Is, say that again. Is that run by the ego mind? What do you mean run? Like it feels like those subtle things are under the onus of the ego mind. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have to then get into the shristi, dristi, dristi, shristi. Yeah. Thing. okay yeah so we're if we're talking in a shristi dristi vada point of view which means a materialistic point of view that we're all body minds we're living in this shared space that we call the world or the universe and each body mind has their own consciousness yeah that's the that's shristi dristi vada mm -hmm. that's the realist framework that's the everyday framework of reality yes more or less you'd say you know the person has some kind of control over their thoughts you know some the person has some kind of control over their actions their intentions their desires okay we could say that now if you inquire into that you'll see their problems with that as well from a dristi shristi point of view everything is a projection of the mind Dristi shristi point of view means consciousness um, comes first. Right. Yeah. That consciousness is the seat of everything. And everything we see, gross or subtle, is actually a manifestation of consciousness. Yeah. What actually happens in, in the view that Bhagwan puts to us, he advises we take the view, which is that there's pure consciousness. Now, within pure consciousness, there appears, or there appears to appear, 
the I thought, which is the ego, which is the I am the body idea. And this I thought then projects the entire body, mind and world. So that everything you see, hear, feel, touch, anything you think, any emotions you have, any imaginings you have, any experiences you have at all, that is all projection of the ego. That is all ego. Make sense? Am I, I'm yes. not going too quickly? No. Good. Okay. So then that this is all Maya. Gross objects, subtle objects, all objects are Maya. What we'll notice is that there are many different ways to categorize Maya. I've just given you one categorization system for Maya. I've said gross and subtle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've divided all of Maya into two. Gross and subtle. Yeah. And I can say anything you see, any, any object will either be a gross object or it'll be a subtle object. And that's one categorization system. But there are infinite numbers of ways you can categorize Maya. Lots of different ways. So all categorization systems are only for Maya. Mm -hmm. 